laid out. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, we can get started with the afternoon session. So we're happy to have Yuji Tachikawa here. He'll be talking about anomalies and uh, topological phases for relativistic quantum field theories. Yuji. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk. And I also need to thank the local organizers for rearranging my schedule at the last minute because just so I was supposed to talk on the first week originally, but uh, our entire family had stomach and uh, intestine problems due to some virus called rota virus. Um, yeah, my daughter goes to nursery, and as you know, the nursery is kind of like a huge incubation plant for the whatever kind of viri viruses and germs and uh, yeah so, so I'm sorry about that but uh, luckily I can come uh, in this week and I'd like to talk about anomalies and uh, topological phases uh, basically uh, essentially for uh, relativistic systems and you have heard already about this topic a lot f uh, from Ma Max Metlitsky last week and uh, I kind of watched the, the videos online of his lectures for the, last, for, for the first three of them, which was available. And uh, it turned out that there are lots of overlaps, so I, I need to restructure my talk. But uh, let's see. Um, so if it, it felt a bit too repetitive for you, please just interrupt me. And uh, another thing I I'd like to say uh, before starting is that uh, I basically gave the same kind of lectures in CERN last, uh, last year and uh, s some of you just told me that you watched them online so in that case that will be a total repeat and I'm sorry about that but uh, yeah I'm going to basically repeat it. So to start as you know uh, the study of anomalies is an extremely old subject um, and uh, f this Tazi school has also a long history and there has been a, see, a number of good lectures on anomaly uh, in this Tazi lectures and for example you can go to archive and just look for Tazi lectures and anomalies and you find one uh, by Jeffrey Harvey from two 2003 um, I recommend it it to all of you and in it you can find a standard or I should say old-fashioned way of understanding anomalies in uh, very well explained and in a very detailed way so you can find almost all about the traditional ways of viewing anomalies in that lectures from 16 years ago so I'm not going to repeat that rather I'd like to uh, present uh, uh, kind of a new way of viewing at anomalies inspired by uh, recent advances in the condensed matter physics side of the theoretical physics. So um, in a word, well, it's not a word, in a sentence, um, <laughs> the essence is captured by the following. So uh, uh, d-dimensional anomaly is captured by uh, a special type, very special type of uh, d plus 1d uh, dimensional topological theory. So this point of view unifies uh, various observations people made about anomalies, uh, both continuous anomalies and discrete anomalies and mixed anomalies, everything. Everything can be captured by this unified point of view. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the uh, lectures I'm going to talk this week. And so this is the essential point and my slightly more concrete aim is to review various known 
facts and constructions in HEPTH or even before that in the obtained in the 80s and uh, uh, string theory uh, from this point of view I forgot to say in the beginning that uh, I just arrived here yesterday from Japan and uh, it's about 4 o'clock in the <laughs> 4 a.m. In, in, so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to say something extremely stupid during the lecture. <laughs> so please stop me and correct me uh, when I say anything totally wrong. So this is the aim and I have a motto and I'd like to quote uh, uh, analects of Confucius. <laughs> well, a certain percentage of the audience is, ha has East Asian background, right? So I assume that all, all, m most of you understand, so 2.11. Two <laughs> so which, which says, uh, <laughs> Well, I, can tr I will translate for you. I mean, I don't <laughs> expect all of you to understand Chinese. Um, so, so the first letter means war warm warm warming up, warm up, and this means old. And this is and or then. And this means uh, this letter is, is to know, and this means new. So. In an English sentence, this means that by warming up the old things, you will learn uh, new things. So I, what I'm going to actually review in the rest of the talk is not really new. Everything is known essentially in the 80s. But I will present them from a point of view, a modern point of view. Uh, does any of you know how this sentence continues in the analects? Uh, let me just tell you. <laughs> well, I mean, if you are Chinese, you should know. <laughs> so, l let me explain. This means can, and uh, this this bit can become, become, or to make. This is master, indeed. <laughs> so this means that if you can warm up old things and learn new things from that, then you can become a master in that field. So that's <laughs> the kind of uh, what I'm trying to do. So uh, the rough contents of my talks are the following. So at the beginning, I will very quickly give you a very general uh, fact about anomalies, generalities, which won't take too much time. And then I'm going to give you a series of ex examples which shows various types of anomalies, uh, some of which are well known, some of which might be lesser known. and. Uh, So, firstly, I will talk about Dirac quantization of charges from the point of view of the anomalies. And then I will discuss anomaly of the fermions. Then I will talk about anomalies of the Maxwell field. Maxwell fields and other anti-symmetric tensor fields. And then and then I will discuss uh, anomalies of 
of finite groups. Uh, in 1D, and then I will talk about the same thing in 2D. So those are the examples I prepared in my uh, lecture notes. And then at the end, I would discuss some game you can play with gauging. That was my original pl plan for my four lectures. But as I said, Max Metlitsky already told you about <laughs> many of the things. So I might need to uh, rethink about exactly what to talk uh, if, uh, if I, I mean, if he, uh, after I checked the fourth lecture of Max Metlitsky af after the video is available. So anyway, so do you have any questions at this moment? Um, if not, I'm going to go to the main part of the talk. I is this okay? All right. I guess I'll just say yes. maybe on behalf of the students that yes. it's not always bad to hear about the same things Good. more than one <laughs> Right. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, uh, so both Ken and Nati started uh, their lectures by talking about what Q is a QFT, what are QFTs, and how to think about them. Um, let me start with a similar question. What does a quantum field theory say Q uh, in D dimensions do? for us? It's a very general question. Um, one way, one, one part, so the answer to this question is, I mean, it's a vast subject. And at QFT, Q would do for you a lot. But one thing it would do for you is the following. So let's say, you have a d-dimensional manifold with two boundaries, which is d minus one dimensional. What, what this QFT does for you is that it associates a Hilbert space, right? And for each of the boundary, and then there is an evolution operator which you can write as Z determined by this Y D. So this is the evolution operator. So this is a very basic fact about QFT. In particular, when this d-dimensional manifold, yd, if it doesn't have any boundary, if it's closed, then formally you can think of these Hilbert spaces attached to be just one-dimensional uh, complex vector space C. And that's a formality. And you can just think of the uh, this z which is known as the partition function. And it's a complex number. This is a, a complex. <coughs> so that's what you learn, right? When you learn quantum field theory. The you, you learn that, that it's very important to compute partition function, and from which you can derive correlation functions by performing functional derivative with respect to the background fields, and from the correlation functions you can compute many other things. So it's very important to compute this partition function, which we learn for f when you first learn these things, is a complex number. 
But this is not completely uh, correct when you have an anomaly. So if you learn, when, when you first learn what an anomaly is, you learn that if the system has an anomaly, if the system has an anomaly, uh, you learn that this partition function zyd has a phase ambiguity, right? In some sense or other. So when you first learn to host anomalies, I mean triangle anomalies in, or fermions, what you learn is that, well, you can compute the partition function under uh, and, uh, some background gauge field. But if you perform gauge transformation for this background field, this partition function changes the phase. So um, it doesn't have a unique complex number as the partition function. Um, but an anomalous theory not just have a phase ambiguity. It is very important to remember that it has a controllable phase ambiguity, right? If you don't know how to control it, I mean, that's very much worse than having a quantum anomaly. What's good about quantum anomaly is that you know how it transforms under various uh, gauge transformations. So how do we, how do we characterize characterize it. That has been a long-standing question, and there has been many answers to that, some of which were reviewed in the Tazi lectures I just mentioned by Jeff Harvey, which involves descent formalisms of anomalies, uh, anomaly polynomials, and so on. But, and that's very general, yes. But that only applies to continuous uh, gauge symmetries and continuous anomalies associated to that. But there is a more universal way of phrasing what an anomaly is, which applies both to these more traditional continuous anomalies and to uh, a, a, another type of more subtle versions of anomalies. So. So let me rephrase this thing again. I mean, a controllable phase ambiguity. What is that? So this z is a number in some sense, a complex number, right, with controllable phase ambiguity. But what is a complex number with a controllable phase ambiguity? Do you know something like that appearing in math? Well, there is a good candidate, which you know. So that is a vector. That is a vector in a one-dimensional complex vector space. Uh, without a basis, without canonical basis. Right? What do, we, what do I mean by that? So let's just forget the physics for a moment, and let's just think about one-dimensional complex vector space, V, right? So it's almost like a complex number, but still a bit different. Because if you pick an element v, I mean, it's not really a complex number, right? In order to extract a complex number out of this v, what you need to do is to pick a basis 
basis of v, which I denote by b because it's a basis, then, as you know, v, your favorite vector, divided by basis vector, this is a complex number, right? So I can really write it as an element in C. But that's your choice. If somebody else, if somebody else decided to choose a different basis, um, that person would consider V divided by B prime, which is a different complex number. And they are different. How are they different? Well, one complex number is related to another complex number you get by this multiplicative factor. So this means that you can model what is happening here about the controllable phase of the ambiguity of the partition function uh, of a quantum field theory by saying that, well, the partition function of an anomalous QFT is not really a number, but it's an element in a one-dimensional vector space. And what we usually think of a partition function is, in fact, the ratio of that number uh, with respect to a basis vector. So this means that in a very general sense, um, in order to describe describe an anomalous QFT Q, um, you can't say that this partition function for a closed manifold is a complex number. That's not quite correct because it has a phase ambiguity. Instead, you say that this is an element, fixed element, of a one-dimensional vector space. So this is a one-dimensional vector space. So this abstract way of saying that uh, it captures all of the phase controllable phase ambiguities appearing in, in the anomaly. But it didn't solve the, the question, right? It just translated the original question into how you would specify this mysterious one-dimensional vector space. So the question is, how should we specify this one-dimensional vector space? To do that, you need a machinery which gives us a vector space for whatever d-dimensional object. <coughs> is there a natural thing? Well, if you look at these blackboards, there is almost an answer, right? If you have a, well, I, I, we are talking about QFTQ, but this is ge very general, right? You can change the dimensions. In this blackboard, it says that if QFT is a d-dimensional QFT, it assigns a vector space, which is a Hilbert space, for a d minus one dimensional manifold, right? Here, you need a one dimensional vector space for yd, d-dimensional manifold. So a natural answer to this question, how you get one dimensional vector space for d-dimensional manifold is the following. So what you need to do what you need to do is to specify a d plus one dimensional theory, let's call it A, such such that um so this theory A would associate a Hilbert space, right? 
for d dimensional theory. And I'd like to demand that this is always always one dimensional. Right? Then you can say that this partition function of the original uh, d dimensional theory is not really a complex number, but is a vector in this Hilbert space of the one dimensional higher theory. So this way, you see that it, it will be possible to characterize the anomaly of a d-dimensional theory by using a rather special type of quantum field theory in d plus 1 dimensions. So what is so special about this d plus 1 dimensional theory? Well, this part is kind of peculiar for those of you, I mean, for, for people like me who studied, uh, who started to study QFT a uh, long time ago. Because when I first learned quantum field theory, uh, the selling point was that it allows you to, I mean, discuss infinite number of degrees of freedom. So the Hilbert space would be huge. Here, Hilbert space is just one dimensional. So in some, in some sense, it's extremely simple as, as far as QFT is concerned. But still, it does the job of describing the structure of the anomaly of, uh, uh, of QFT is one dimension lower. So let me, let me draw a picture of what is going on. I mean, so originally we thought that we have this QFTQ in, on, the, on the manifold YD. But in fact, it's better to think that you have a theory A, which is, I, I use the letter A because it captures the anomaly of, of this QFTQ. So you have this special theory A in one dimension or higher. And it's better, I mean, the anomaly can be usefully characterized by considering this whole setup of having YD on the boundary and uh, eh, with, with the theory Q and this anomaly theory A in one dimensional higher. So let me just give it a name, y, WD plus 1. So in HEP TH, you would call this you are typically interested in this boundary theory. So this is boundary. I mean, this is anomalous. This is anomalous QFT. And uh, we didn't have any good name for this, but uh, this is the anomaly theory, which characterized the anomaly of that. Um, Conmat people would call this theory Q as, say, boundary edge modes. And the theory A would correspond to bulk, uh, something called SPT phase. So, the good thing about recent developments and recent interactions uh, between HEPTH and CONMAT is that you can import uh, various concepts and studies developed on the other side to, to this side, I mean, depending on your point of view. So in my case, I was uh, <laughs> raised in the HEPTH side. So I, I find various discussions in the CONMAT side very interesting, and then we are in the process of importing many of the new concepts on this side. And then you need to learn how to translate various words. But once you learn the basics, uh, you start to understand how things get translated. So the, the point is, again, it's very fruitful to think that the anomalous theory Q 
lives on the boundary of a special uh, d plus one dimensional theory. So another name you often find in the literature for this bulk SPT phase is an invertible theory. So this is called often called invertible Q QFT. Um, Nati told me yesterday that you don't like the word invertible QFT. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, well, the, the, it's useful to know what people call them just to understand the literature. Um, yeah, so there are names. So these are the generalities, and I'm going to discuss various uh, explicit examples. Uh, do you have any questions at this moment? Yes. So, could you explain the lack of canonical basis? Right. In the Z point of, because if I take two disjoint copies of this manifold, right. I think that this function should be the product. That's right. And then I can use the product structure to, to choose from one. That's right. Some of the description is Right. Ah, so. Could you repeat the question? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, the question was um, what do I mean by not having a canonical choice of a basis? Um, and uh, the, he said, um, for example, suppose you have a manifold yd and you consider partition function yd. <laughs> And suppose you have another manifold, and you consider another ma partition function, then he says that, well, suppose you have a basis here and a basis there, then in the product, I mean, you, you can consider this joint union as the, your space time, and then you would have canonical basis in the product, right? So that's your point. But the question, but that's definitely true. But the problem is that what, there are many manifolds which is not a disjoint union, right? So y you at least need to start with the fact that, uh, I mean, y you need to find a basis in this irreducible case. So, right. Well. Um, yes, there is a multiplicative structure if you have a disjoint union as, a, as your space time. But if you just have a space time alone, then the fact, if your QFT is anomalous, um, it's very difficult to choose a canonical, canonical basis. If you can choose a canonical basis, then you can always refer to your partition function uh, with respect to that canonical basis that, that fixes for you exactly one complex number as the partition function. So then the anomaly goes away. But, but he, he uh, ma made a good point that uh, when you assign, when we are going to assign these Hilbert spaces, um, you need to require that uh, for disjoint union, uh, this Hilbert space in which the um, partition uh, anomalous partition function takes value in should satisfy this rather uh, mysterious condition that, uh, I mean, if you consider this joint union, then the Hilbert space needs to be a tensor product. And that's something you need to impose if you, are, if you want to do uh, this business mathematically precise. And that's indeed true. But the point is that this relation only allows you to choose a canonical basis given canonical bases of the individual ones. Any other questions? Yes. What are, we doing, or what are the conditions on YD such that it, has a, uh, that it is a boundary of, say, a WB plus 1? For example, the real projected plane ah. can't be built. Well, I mean, I. Could you repeat the question? Ah, thank you. So, um, so the que his question was, I mean, uh, can, can you get, can can you do this business if you don't, if you don't know that there is a WD plus one for which YD is a boundary? Um, in fact, I'm not using that fact. I mean, I was intentionally imprecise about what I draw on the other side. 
Um, in order for this formal, formalism to work, yd doesn't have to be a boundary, right? I mean, all you have to have is a one-dimensional higher quantum field theory. This quantum field theory associates a Hilbert space of states for whatever yd, right? It doesn't have to be a boundary. Yeah. Yes. Right. Where? Well, in the middle board, we're saying Z and so Z turns YD into a specific boundary inside of this. That's right. So, uh, ah, so, so, thank you for the question. The question was, okay, I, I, I think I repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was, um, what, what I wrote here and what I wrote there seems not consistent. And uh, yes, it's not consistent. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So we, I started by talking about the general facts about Q, non -anom these are for non-anomalous QFTs, right? So for non-anomalous QFTs, um, for each d minus one dimensional manifolds, you have Hilbert space of states, right? And you have partition functions which are complex numbers. So that's the standard situation. But in this formulation, um, anomalous theory is a bit more complicated. Ano for anomalous theories, partition function is not really a number. It's a vector in one dimensional vector space. So that's the answer. And uh, these things become more complicated if you want to be completely mathematically precise uh, for anomalous QFTs. Any other questions? Yes? What are the conditions for the series A to be uh, So the question was, when can a Q anomaly of a QFT can be captured by a uh, uh, one-dimensional higher theory? I don't know. That's a very good question. Um, the many things which are called anomalies in HEPTH literature, uh, have been by now translated into the language of this one-dimensional higher theory. But there are a few which haven't been translated this way. I mean, first of all, I don't know how, how about, uh, I don't know the situation about conformal anomalies. Um, yeah, is conformal anomalies captured by d plus one dimensional theory? I doubt it. I'm not sure about that. And uh, there's also a very subtle type of anomalies in supersymmetric theories, like shortening anomalies, right? Found by Nati and uh, collaborators. I don't know whether it's captured by a theory in one higher dimension. So but it, it will be a nice thing to think about. So you can go over literature and find various other types of anomalies and uh, what would be the interpretation in terms of uh, one-dimensional higher QFT. Yeah, um, so a lot of various diverse type of anomalies can be captured in these formalisms, uh, as I'm going to uh, demonstrate by examples. But uh, yeah, I don't know whether it covers all. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, so let me repeat the question. So the question was, um, so you, he, he asked me, um, usually on the very mathematical side of community, people think of QFTs as a, QFT as a functor uh, associating, I mean, Hilbert space to D dimensional one manifold, D minus one dimensional manifold, and uh, morphisms for D dimensional manifold, but that only applies to non anomalous QFTs, yes. Um, for anomalous QFTs, um, that needs to be generalized. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, this point has been noticed by mathematicians long time ago in the early 90s. If you look up very careful literature from those days, I mean, they, I mean, originally Atia and others came up with the idea of using category to describe QFT, and then Witten came up with this idea of Jones polynomials and how to associate topological quantum field theory for Chan-Simons theories. 
And then mathematicians try to combine the both ideas by um, idea of Atiyah and idea of Witten. And immediately they r ran into a lot of, I mean, subtle mathematical problems. Uh, because of the fact that the Chan-Simons theory has gravitational anomalies. And uh, there are lots of confusing literatures at this point. <laughs> right. But the point, but <coughs> the, yeah, the point is that you need to attach uh, space-time with one dimensional high, higher, and you need to think, consider theory, so, some very special theory on top of it. Any questions? All right. So let me start discussing examples. And many examples I'm going to discuss, in fact, have been discussed by previous lecturers. But uh, let me do that anyway. So example one. So it's a direct quantization. Um, maybe I should not cite the original works. <laughs> not to, but uh, uh, I couldn't resist. So, so this work is originally done by Dirac you know, in 1931. So it's almost a century old. <laughs> so this is Dirac quantization. So, uh, but I will present in a way different from the original paper by Dirac, right? But uh, let's consider 0 plus 1D, uh, QFT, which everyone knows is a, just an, another name of quantum mechanics, and coupled to uh, background U1 field. So uh, I watched the videos and I noticed that Greg discussed the case of uh, particle moving on S1, which is one example. And uh, Nati just discussed the case of Dirac fermion in quantum mechanics coupled to U1. Um, so those are two examples. I would discuss more, in some sense, extremely trivial example. So let's say you have S1 as a space-time for the quantum mechanics, and you have background U1 gauge field A, right? And uh, so let's say the integral of this A dx, I mean, I'm somehow parameterizing this circle as x, and you integrate that right? And uh, you consider exponential of i phi, uh, which is a group element, which is in the u1, right? So so, I, so Greg and Nati discussed how such a system arises in two specific cases of a particle on S1 and the case of a Dirac fermion. But let's forget about the details. And let's just say that, let's just say that the partition function ZQ um, S1 with this group element G turned out to be exponential of I times Q times this integral of ADX. Uh, which is this group element G to the power Q, right? So, so, so if so, so this is this is well defined complex number. If Q is an integer, so this point was emphasized <laughs> again and again, and I'm I'm saying that again. But not well defined, right? Not well defined if not. So this can be thought of as a phase ambiguity. And uh, this is a, an anomaly. So how do we characterize 
sorry, it didn't go all the way up. So how do we control the anomaly? How do we control the phase rotation? So one way can be as follows. So I'm just repeating the equation I wrote there. G is exponential of y phi. And this means that phi, phi going to phi plus 2 pi, uh, that shouldn't change G, right? But when Q is some general number, IQ phi changes under this transformation. And this becomes IQ uh, phi plus 2 pi, which is an original IQ phi, but with uh, some additional phase factor, I 2 pi Q. So this way, the phase ambiguity is controlled, under control. So it's not as bad as losing the predictability completely. So that's one way to control uh, the anomaly. And another way was also mentioned by Nati, which is to attach uh, a two-dimensional manifold. So let's pick. So what you do is to attach some two-dimensional manifold. Say, I, I'm using the letter W, so let me use W. And uh, let's pick a, some theta over 2 pi, which is equal to Q mod 1. So you need to choose something. And then you consider the bulk theory, which is just classical, has this action, f over 2 pi. So this f is the gauge field of strength, uh, as everyone knows. So in this setup, I had this term as before on the boundary. And uh, and uh, you now have a bulk and the bulk provides this term i theta f over 2 pi w and as already mentioned by Nati the combination combination has a fixed has a definite value which is good but the problem is i mean the fact that the original thing had a controllable phase ambiguity is translated to the fact that uh, the value depends on how you extend the manifold and how you extend this uh, gauge field to F. So you, you consider different extension And the point is that this value and this value, they are both the same. I mean, bo both definitely defined, but they are different. They are indif different. How are they different? So the ratio of this thing and that thing is 
exponential for i theta integrated over w minus w prime of f2 pi, where you can visualize uh, w minus w prime as, I mean, you have this original manifold w, and that con contributes this integral. But you, need, you want to subtract that, right? So a useful way to consider the negative of that exponential is to consider the orientation reversal of w prime. So I'm just calling it minus w prime. And you consider the entire closed space-time. And you evaluate this bulk action there. Yes? I think this is obvious, but uh, f on w prime is different, but you're just calling the extension on that side f as well? That's right. Uh, the question was, yeah, the, I need to repeat the question. But I, I, was, I wasn't perfectly precise when I say I use this symbol f for the f extended on this side, because I, ex I took the orientation reversal. Yeah, but yeah. Is it the sound of a rain rainstorm? Okay. So, so the point is that if you integrate f over 2 pi on a closed manifold, and it's an integer, right? So it's an integer n. But for general theta, this is not, of course, 1. So this means that the definite values you obtain by extending the gauge field and the space-time to one higher dimensions depends on how you actually extend. So these are two ways of understanding anomalies. One is this way of controlling the anomalies. Another is to ascribe them to a different choice of the extension. Right? So, so in a sense, I, wh what I did was to derive the charge, electric charge quantization, assuming that you already know that the gauge field is de described by a U1 gauge field, which is geometric and has this um, definite uh, quantization of the magnetic charge. So once you assume that magnetic charge is quantized this way, um, in order for the partition function of uh, zero plus one dimensional quantum mechanics not to depend on the extension, you need to have the charge electric charge to be integer. So that's one way to understand Dirac quantization. So Dirac quantization is a way to say that the electric charge of a world line is non-anomalous in the presence of non-trivial ele uh, electromagnetic field. So that's the example one. Do you have any more questions about example one? I think this, is, this has been discussed so many times in this Tazi school, so I think Everyone understands that. Good. So the next example would take more time. And that's the example two. So I would have 50 more minutes, right? I guess. Yeah, more like 20. 20, okay. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about massless fermions. So massless fermions famously have anomalies. It's the first system where people notice the anomalies. And uh, it's in some sense the first system where people understood that the anomaly is characterized by having one dimensional higher space-time. And again, it's discussed already by Max Metlitsky and also by Tom de Grand in the lattice setup. So let me just recap what you lear learned from them. So it can be 
any dimensions, but for the sake of definiteness, let's say you have 4D system and 5D bulk. And uh, let's consider Dirac and 5D Dirac fermion with varying mass. Right? So you can see the top, but <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's not too complicated to draw the graph on top of this. So let's say that the mass term of the 5D Dirac fermion goes something like this from 0 plus m and minus m, right? And I'm not going to repeat how you derive the existence of the zero modes because Tom de Grand had a nice discussion of that. But what you can learn from solving the equation, Dirac equation in 5D, is that you have a zero mode concentrated on this transition region of the mass parameter and it has a definite chirality. So the chirality depends on whether the mass goes this way or mass goes the other way, right? If you say this corresponds to the positive chirality, this corresponds to the negative chirality. So, the entire 5D system is non-anomalous. Therefore, this means that if you embed anomalous chiral fermion system in 4D as arising from this position-dependent mass of a 5D fermion, then the entire system has a definite partition function. So you can use this five-dimensional massive fermion system as the one-dimensional higher thing that controls the anomaly of the 4D chiral fermion. So it it appeared in many places. Um, it appeared originally in Cal and Harvey in Western Europe. I mean, oh, but uh, uh, up, uh, on the same year, um, Shatashvili and Fadev had basically the same idea in in Russian paper. So, uh, so again, ascribing uh, who. who found the concepts first is a difficult business, but uh, it, it's long known. So, in this sense, in order to understand the anomaly of a 4D fermion, you can just think about 5D fermion, right? But that's a bit too much in some sense, because 5D fermion system still has infinitely many degrees of freedom. It's a quantum field theory with local excitations, right? But that's in some sense, a bit overkill. As I said in the general generalities, when I discussed generalities, you have to, you only have to use a very simple uh, QFT in one dimension or higher for which uh, there is only one state in the Hilbert space. So you can just throw away lots of physical info about the one dimension or higher theory if the only thing you want to do is to characterize the anomaly of uh, four-dimensional theory. So how would you do that? <coughs> well, first of all, first of all, um, This is a bit different from the picture I draw here, right? 
Here, I extended the space-time only on the, this side. But uh, in this picture, in order to des describe the anomaly on the bo boundary I mean, over 4D, I needed to extend the space-time on both this direction and that, that direction, right? So that's a bit different. So I first do a trick of flipping this side on the other side, which you can formally do, right? So you have a, you just flip this side on the other side, but this makes this anomaly theory to have the partition function of this form, 5D fermion with positive mass but because you flipped this thing on this side, well, you have to divide it by 5D fermion with negative mass. So the anomaly theory formally has a partition function, which is given by the ratio of the 5D fermion with positive mass and negative mass. And uh, this still has lots of degrees of freedom. But we just want to characterize the anomaly. So let's just take the limit where the absolute value of the mass becomes infinite, right? So that propagating moles become extremely massive and goes away. So this is the partition function of the one-dimensional higher anomaly theory, which characterizes the anomaly of the uh, 4D fermion. So this thing is known as exponential of 2 pi i eta, where this is the eta invariant. I'm, and I'm sorry to say that I'm using a different convention than the convention used by Nati. So there's a factor of two difference. Uh, So I should say that in the Atia Patodi Zingas paper, where this thing was originally introduced, they used both eta invariant and the xi invariant. And this is, in fact, a xi invariant, unfortunately. Right. And uh, Right. So, but, but the important message I want to tell you is that uh, when I first heard of eta invariant appearing in this business, I was very scared. That looked very complicated and uh, um, scary. But in fact, it's not, it's not, I mean, very scary. And it's, in fact, very computable. Um, in any case, it's just, the ratio of partition function, the free theory. So it's nothing to be worried about. This is something you can actually uh, work on, and which is something you can compute. So very formally, eta invariant is computed by taking the limit, and uh, you just compute the ratio, right? And, and because eta is the log, of the partition function, um, this just becomes a sum over all Dirac eigenvalues, eigenvalues of Dirac operator. And because I pulled out a factor of 2 pi, I need to divide by 2 pi. And you and something like this. And uh, because I'm a physicist, I'm going to use an extremely uh, bad way of non-guaranteed way of computation by exchanging the order, right? And taking the mass going to infinite limit. And if you do that very formally, uh, you get that uh, this is given by one half the sine of the eigenvalue e. And uh, in, in my convention, sine, 
sine of 0 is plus 1. And sine of positive thing is plus 1. And sine of negative thing is minus 1. But of course, this needs to be regularized. So I would put double quote. Um, so to compute the eta invariant, you need to use some regularizations. And if you look up math papers to thinking that you want to learn how to compute the eta invariant, in, invariably, they use zeta function regularizations to compute. Uh, but you don't have to use zeta function com uh, regularizations, because in any case, this is just the ratio of the partition functions of a fermion system, right? And we know that whatever regularization scheme you use, you get the same answer. So in fact, you don't have to use the zeta function regularization. You just have to use your favorite regularizations. And uh, as long as it's a reasonable one, then you, you get the correct answer. So right. So let's do some exercise. Uh, Right. Let's do some exercise, which is related to Natty's example. Um, yeah, I still have 10 minutes or something. So consider let's you consider let's consider you want charged Dirac fermion on S1, right, S1. And let's say the holonomy is phi, so g is exponential i phi, um, right. Remember that Nati used this to discuss an anomaly of 0 plus 1 dimensional system. But I'm using this as uh, to characterize the anomaly of uh, 0 plus 0 dimensional system, because I'm using this as a bulk theory with mass. But anyway, here Dirac operator is just you know, partial x plus phi, right? So the eigenvalues. are just n plus phi over 2 pi in some units, right? And of course, you can use zeta function regularizations. But I prefer not to. Um, so let's use, I mean, exponential. So this, this is E. This is E. I mean, the standard regularization you use is this exponential regularization, right? To, to regularize. And then take the limit where the regularization goes away. So eta is limit of gold is 0, 1 half, and sine of n plus phi over 2 pi over n, an exponential of minus t, n plus phi over 2 pi. This is extremely simple to compute, because this is just the uh, sum of exponentials, right? It's a geometric series for both positive and negative n. You need to be careful about where this turns positive and negative. But this is extremely simple to compute. This becomes 1 half minus phi over 2 pi. So this means that uh, exponential of 2 pi i phi is, in fact, because, because of this 1 half, you have minus and then you exponential minus i phi. So this is the end result. I mean, uh, again, there are 
a few different conventions, unfortunately, for the eta invariant, and I'm sorry about that. But the important thing, yes, pardon? Thank you. Nati corrected me the alphabet. Yeah. <laughs> I, re I repeated the comment. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the important thing is this entire exponentiated versions of the exponential, and nobody uh, has any different con nobody has any different convention for that. So this is the final answer. So, so this meant this just meant that uh, the bulk theory after you integrated out the massive fermion behaves, I mean, this behaves as exponential of i integral of a, i a. So this explains, I mean, from, from path integral point of view, the shift in the level k by 1 when, when the mass between, I mean, between the positive mass and the negative mass. So, right. So, I'm going to give you an, another example of computing eta invariant in a specific manifold tomorrow, but uh, I'd like to end today's discussion by uh, mentioning a more general case. I mean, this type of explicit computations of eta invariant is only possible when you know the entire Dirac spectrum, which is not always the case. It is often oh, the case in a lot of cases because you typically, you often are interested in a very symmetric type of space-time, but very generally it is not. So in that case, how do you compute the eta invariant? So let me just say to you. So. Um, I, I should very quickly remind you that originally we'd like to discuss the anomaly of a fermion on d-dimensional manifold, and you discuss the the anomaly by considering one-dimensional higher space-time, and you consider ratio of ratio of z fermion and z fermion and mass very positive and mass very negative so you consider this right and uh, just as before this depends on the how you extend suppose you have various holes so again, you have z fermion here and there, and you want to discuss the ratio. The ratio is is the this is z fermion m very very large over z fermion m very very small, evaluated on the combined manifold, on the combined manifold, obtained by attaching this WD plus 1, and this part is WD plus 1 prime. So in order to characterize the anomaly of a d-dimensional fermion, you would like to compute this ratio of the fermion, massive fermions, on closed d plus 1 dimensional space time and uh, as i said that's just a definition of the eta invariant but how do you how do you compute that uh, maybe i should go here but then how do you compute so, now we have this combined 
spacetime of w and w prime with a minus sign, but this is a closed manifold. And suppose you can further extend it to d plus one, d plus two dimensions. So let's call this u, d plus two. Then there's a very nice theorem called Atia patodi zinga theorem, which says that the eta invariant of the boundary is equal to the number of zero modes of Dirac operator on U uh, plus the integral over U d plus 2 of this standard uh, anomaly combination. So this is the APS theorem. Um, yeah, I know I need to wrap up. So I have a few comments about this APS index theorem. So when you learned anomalies in your standard QFT textbook in, in some advanced chapter, you have definitely seen the standard Atia Zinga index theorem, right? That looked very similar to this. But the stand, more, more standard Atia Zinga index theorem theorem is about when partial u which is w which is empty right in that case you don't have this left hand side contribution which is the eta so this becomes a theorem giving you i mean the index of the Dirac fermion in terms of this curvature integral, which is very useful. But here, we are interested in just this exponentiated combination of exponential 2 pi i eta, right? So for the usual application of the APS theorem, you are mostly concerned about computing this index, which is an integer, right? But to, for the computation of this eta invariant mod 1, if you raise it, the exponential of 2 pi i, the index part fortunately goes away. I mean, the pr problem is that usually you don't have any control of the index on this open space. But it's good that it is integer, and it goes away. So <laughs> if you raise it, you just get eta invariant exponentiated. It's just exponentiated uh, curvature integral. U trace f2 pi. So this is one way to compute the eta invariant for very general situations. So if you know, if you happen to know a d plus two dimensional space u for which the boundary is the w you are interested, then you all, all you have to do is to just compute this curvature integral. So which might seem more tractable to you because it's just a standard integral of differential forms. Yes? Um, so the question was, does this mean that there's no anomaly in the other dimensions? Because this thing only has uh, even dimension terms and this vanishes. That's a very good point. But um, so the answer is the following. Um, this means that if you consider odd dimensional d for which d plus 1 is even, for which d plus 2 is odd again, this time is just z 0. So this time is just 1. But that assumes that this d plus one, two dimensional, I mean, you can find such a u for which your w is a boundary, but that's not always the case. So this tells you that the anomaly of an odd dimensional fermion can only come from a d plus one dimensional space for which you cannot find such a uh, u. 
So th thank you for pointing that out. And uh, but, yeah, right. So so I, I'm going to really stop by applying this uh, case, th this theorem, for 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 this uh, very simple case, right? For a very simple case. So how do you how do you apply that? How do you apply that? So this S1 is W, right? And you definitely know a good manifold for which S1 is a boundary, right? This is just a disk. So this is U. So you apply you apply that formula and you immediately conclude that exponential 2 pi i eta is exponential of just f of 2 pi. Uh, right. Over u2. Right. And uh, this gives you, and you can easily partially integrate, and this gives you exponential i phi, right? And you need to accuse me. Oh, <laughs> I, I mean, th 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 there's some uh, sorry si sign convention which is wrong, but uh, you need to you need to be angry about me because here I wrote. No, I mean this part is okay, but. What is this minus sign, right? You should, you should worry about it. And uh, I didn't get the minus sign. So the point was that I implicitly chose, uh, when I computed this eta invariant, the periodic boundary condition for the fermion as the zero point of the U1 phase. But that doesn't extend uh, into the disk. So when, when you learn string theory, you are conf Everyone gets confused about the NS spin structure and the R spin structure and how they transform between cylindrical coordinate and the disk coordinate. And that's what's happened here. And uh, so this exercise I just did in front of you shows that you need to be careful about whether all of the data uh, you have on your manifold correctly extends to the bar to, to on the boundary it extends to the bulk. And the good thing about the eta invariant is that it's computable, but it's very sensitive to very subtle data like spin structure and etc. <coughs> and I'm going to discuss a few more examples uh, tomorrow. So thank you very much. for you. Uh, so the band I'm in was playing a house party last night. <laughs> you may be wondering why that's good news. And the reason is they had all these leftover cookies. I thought the Tazi students might like those, and maybe the lecturers too. Yes. So I'll put them out with the coffee. So let's thank you again.